We'd uh, like to call uh, this uh, conference to order. And to begin, uh, I'd like to ask Rabbi Marvin Heyer, the founder and president of the Wiesenthal Center, to make some opening comments. And then we'll go directly to the survivors. First, let me say that I'm sure that I speak for all of you. Never in our wildest dreams did we imagine that we would have to have a conference like this. We thought we'd have to have conferences to educate the new world, young people about what took place in the Holocaust. Never did anybody imagine that a head of state who has called for the destruction of the state of Israel who's seeking to acquire nuclear weapons, has called the Holocaust a myth, and to back up his contention that the Holocaust is a myth, he's convened today and tomorrow a conference in Tehran of 67 so-called, I say so-called scholars. They are nothing but debunkers of the Holocaust, haters. For you, the survivors of the Holocaust, this is a horrible time. To have to have been in these camps in Auschwitz, in Mauthausen, in Bergen-Belsen, in Majdanek, in the ghettos, in the labor camps, and to have to explain to the world that you are not, quote unquote, I hate to say the word, that you are not liars or exaggerators is unbelievable. But if you don't do it, because the 67 debunkers today who are in Tehran, they don't know anything about the Holocaust. They were not there. You were there. And it's your story that is the true story of what happened. Unfortunately, President Ahmadinejad, he, he has an agenda. What is his agenda? His agenda is he wants to influence 1 billion, 300 million Muslims that he is the leader of the Muslim world. He takes on Israel, he, t he says America is nothing, the West is nothing, and he wants to destroy Israel, and he's hoping by saying that the Holocaust is a lie, that this will catch on in the Muslim world to one billion, three hundred million Muslims. I hope that that world is smart enough to know that President Ahmadinejad is a mindset of the 12th century. And unfortunately, history put him in our century, in the 21st century. He really belongs in the Middle Ages. But there was an aberration, and he lives, unfortunately, in our time. He must be confronted. And there's no better way to do it than to force the world. We can't say that everybody in the world is going to listen to your stories. But they will be recorded for posterity, and somebody out there will hear what you have to say, which is the truth of the great tragedy that occurred to the Jewish people and to the whole world during the Nazi period. Without any further ado, we want to hear from you, the survivors of the Holocaust, and not from the, the debunkers, as to what happened during that period of time. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, it's an honor for us to begin this conference by calling upon Mr. Saalberger here in Los Angeles to share with us the highlights and the outline of uh, his experiences uh, during the Holocaust. Mr. Berger. My name is Saul Berger. I was born in a small town in southern Poland. The name of the town was Krosno. It had a population of 10,000 people about 7,500 Roman Catholics and approximately 2,500 Jewish people. In 1939, I was one of nine children, five girls and four boys. Four of my sisters emigrated to the United States before the war. We were made living in Poland, one married sister with four brothers. In September 1939, the German army attacked Poland. Following the advancing German army came the Nazi occupation forces, the SS, and immediately they started to beat and kill Jews indiscriminately. The Gestapo took over the rule of the city and all Jewish people were ordered to wear white armbands and blue stars of David. 
Anyone that would be caught on the street without wearing it would be severely punished. All young people, male and female, between the ages of 15 to 45, were ordered to report every day for compulsory slave labor under the supervision of the SS. In 1941, the Nazi Germans started to establish ghettos and started to establish concentration camps for the purpose of a liquidation of the Jewish people completely from Europe. In August 1942, there was the first action in my town in which the, uh, my father was murdered, my mother and my sister were taken away to, uh, to Belzec where they were gassed and burned, my three brothers and I were assigned to hard labor, and eventually they, my younger brother Moses, Michael and my older brother Moses were taken to the concentration camps. My, younger, my older brother Joshua and I escaped from the ghetto while they were taking us to the concentration camps. My brother, I, my brother Joshua was caught and murdered. I escaped to the forest and I was fighting the Nazi Germans between 1942 and 1945 when I was liberated and I remained in Poland for approximately five years in the DP camps in the 1950 to arrive to the United States. Whatever they were saying about the Jews, how they suffered in Poland, nothing compares what the Nazi Germans had in store for us. Their plan was to liquidate completely the Jewish people from the face of the earth. Fortunately, it did not happen, and with God's help, they will disappear forever. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Mr. Berger. We'd now like to uh, shift to New York City to the New York Tolerance Center, and we ask Ms. Fania Heller, who's a survivor from Poland and who was uh, hidden by righteous Gentiles during the Second World War, to please share her experiences with us. Fania, good afternoon. Thank you very much. My name is Fania Gottesworth Heller. I was born in a little village on the, um, in eastern Poland of and uh, I'm very sad and aggravated that 60 years after the genocide, I have to put a, a face to the suffering. Uh, that I have to say that what they're doing now in Iran uh, it was, is not true, that it's not a myth that the Holocaust did happen. Uh, as, as I said, I come from a little shtetl, and we, where I come from, there was killing. There was, we never went to concentration camps. There were no camps. Anti-Semitism was rampant before the war, and uh, there was no need because all the Ukrainians and the Poles helped to kill the Jews. Uh, we were 5,500 inhabitants. And we, we were 1,500 Jews who had parents and, and children and mothers and fathers, and we became statistics. Of the 1,500 Jews, only 45 survived. Uh, uh, I was hidden by a, uh, in, with a Polish family, and they were, there was a cause celebre. There was only one gentle family who had Jews, although my father was a poor engineer. There were no ulterior motives because we had no money. Uh, what happened is I have seen, my eyes have seen things which no human eyes should have seen. I have seen executions, uh, killings, the... Our little village was surrounded by a, a brook, which was red from Jewish blood. The synagogues were burned. Um, who was doing the jobs? Ordinary people like you and I. The German SS Group 101, which was specially trained to eliminate and kill the Eastern European Jews and the Russian Jews without any, any, any uh, regret. They were doing it for the fatherland. Uh, I have seen rape, murder, pillaging, and what's happening now in Iran. I think it's, a, it's, it's inexcusable. It's sacrilegious to the memory of the dead and of, the, and of us, of the living ones. Uh, uh, what we have to do now, I mean, we have to protest because if we repeat the history, History is still being repeated. It, it happened in our lifetime. It can't be repeated again. And that's what they're trying to do. Um, uh, uh, 
of the killing was usually done in all the Jewish holidays where I come from. Uh, after the killing, they were rewarded with vodka and cocktails. These are the people who went home at night to kill us, listened to Beethoven, and went Sunday to the church. These are the people, there were doctors and lawyers that did it for, father, for the fatherland. They were so brainwashed. Uh, of the four, well, all the kids, I went to Hebrew high school, to the most progressive Hebrew Tarbut school. Only two of us are alive, so we became statistics. I lost my entire family, uh, maybe 70 members of the family. Uh, my father was survived with me, but he was killed during the transition. Also, totally disappeared from the, ground, from the earth. Uh, even the, the perpetrators permit that what they did. But what they do to us, the, all this deny us, they, they don't want to permit it. Let me tell you, I, came, I went a few times on the March of the Living. The ovens, they're so well made, they can go on now. Well, we are now in the 70s, 80s, and more. We really have to testify. We have to make sure, although we say never again, nobody listens to us. We have to make sure that we survived and we are brothers keepers. We have to make sure that never again will we become perpetrators or bystanders or victims. Thank you, Fadia. One more minute. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm, I, mean, I mean, it's so heartbreaking that I mean, I have to quote Santayano said, if we forget what happened, we can repeat it. Thank we you, Fadio. We appreciate it. our man your Christ testimony. Never again. Thank you very much. Okay. Let me we, okay. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. We now go to the Canadian Friends of the Sign and Wiesenthal Center, uh, based in uh, <laughs> Toronto. And um, we're, our first testimony comes from. Esther Bem, who is from Yugoslavia, and um, Esther, thank you for joining us, and we look forward to hearing your testimony. Anti-Jewishness and hate attempts to invent history 65 years later. April of 1941, the Nazis marched into Zagreb, Croatia. My mother, father, two older sisters, and me stood by the window of our apartment in shock, watching them advance and parade proudly through the city while the citizens cheered. I was 11 years old. A puppet government was installed that cooperated fully and enthusiastically with the Germans. We were a typical middle-class Jewish family leading a sheltered, ordinary life. Our destiny turned around immediately. We faced one nightmare after another. Every day on the front page of the daily newspaper, there were columns with newly invented racial laws and regulations directed against the Jews. The Jewish school that I attended was closed and barricaded. Jewish homes and businesses were confisc confiscated. Theft of Jewish possessions was legalized and was carried out in an orderly and systematic way. We had to wear the yellow star of David as an emblem of shame and identity. There was absolutely no strategy that one could follow to guarantee survival. Young Jewish people, high school and university students were arrested, sent to the so-called labor camps, and never heard from again. It was chaos. It almost became some kind of lottery of winners and losers. Everybody was asking themselves, who is going to be next? We were evicted from our apartment, had to leave everything behind, and could take with us only our personal belongings. I carried with me my favorite teddy bear, 
who was my companion and reminder of days gone by until I grew up. My two older sisters, 19 and 21 years of age, escaped from Zagreb by train in different directions. Their goodbyes were dreadful, and I cannot be wiped out of my memory. But even so, we did not know then that it was the day of undoing of our family unit and disintegration. All my adult cousins by then were deported to various concentration camps. Yelka, my older sister, left for Bosnia, where she joined <coughs> Marshal Tito's first proletarian underground brigade. She was caught by the enemy in 1942 and executed. My other sister, Vera, joined the partisans in the mountains of Gorski Kotar, became an officer, and was decorated for bravery. Here you have two middle-class Jewish girls, always shielded and protected, felt that it was better to fight with a rifle in your hand and even die than to be led to a concentration camp. After they left, my father paid a German officer in cash and gold for a passage to Italy. The officer was a war profiteer, but he kept his word. When my father handed him the box with gold and jewelry, he ordered him to take off even his wedding ring and throw it in the box. We spent four years in Italy. After Italy surrendered to Germany, a righteous Gentile, a fascist Italian officer, came to our rescue and warned us that we have to escape because there was a meeting with the Gestapo and we are supposed to be taken to the train station tomorrow morning, and that meant Auschwitz. We were hiding in the hills of northern Italy, in the homes of poor Italian farmers who choose to help us, give us shelter and protection. We have putting minute, their own lives minute. in danger. I have to say that they were the elite of humanity, and I will always honor them. We changed locations, identity, survival strategies, but most of the time we went hungry with fear in our bellies, always afraid of being found and denounced. Transition to freedom for me was very difficult. I had to reacquaint myself with my real identity and my Jewishness. Thank you. Thank you, Esther. God bless you. Um, we're now going to uh, come back to Los Angeles. Let me just make a mention to those of you who are participating and also those of you who may be watching. If you or a member of your family was uh, a victim of the Holocaust and they have testimony we ask you to go to Wiesenthal.com and email us that testimony so they can be incorporated into the permanent archives of the Simon Wiesenthal Center. That's W-I-E-S-E-N-T-H-A-L.com. We also have a uh, campaign to the incoming Secretary General Baum of the United Nations urging him to take this issue up as part of the overall counter to the Iranian regime. At this point, I'm honored to call upon Renee Firestone, one of the uh, original speakers for our outreach program back in 1978, and thank God, still going strong, to share for a few moments her personal story. Good morning. My name is Renee Firestone. Uh, I was born in Czechoslovakia, but in 1948, uh, Hungary occupied our territory, and I became a Hungarian uh, citizen at the age of 14. Uh, the war, as you know, was going on, I'm sorry, 38. Uh, I was uh, actually deported from Hungary almost at the end of the war, May 8th, May, uh, I'm sorry, March 
17th, uh, at um, March 17th, uh, 1940, 1944, I'm sorry, 1944, uh, my family was deported. My brother, uh, who was uh, five years older than me, uh, was already in a Hungarian uh, forced labor camp. But the rest of us, my parents, my little sister who was then 14, and I was now almost 20 years old, we were taken to the railroad station, we were packed into cattle cars. Uh, we were told that we are going to Germany to become slave laborers for Germany. Well, we had no idea that extermination camps, killing factories actually already existed in Poland. In 1942, Hitler created six of these extermination camps, which we were totally ignorant of. We were, take, we were packed into cattle cars. The cattle car I was in, there was about 120 of us. Uh, there was hardly a seating place for anybody. We traveled three days, three nights, uh, non, not knowing where we are or what's gonna happen to us. On the fourth day, we were unloaded at a place uh, which uh, we couldn't identify. I could not identify. Uh, we were immediately separated. My sister and I went to one direction. My parents disappeared. Uh, the crowd was uh, absolutely un uh, unrealistic. Uh, there was uh, children crying, looking for their parents. Anyway, uh, we didn't know where our parents were, and my sister and I were directed into the camp. Later on, of course, we found out that my mother was taken straight from the railroad station to the gas chambers. My father stayed in the camp for a while. By the way, we later found out that we are in Auschwitz-Birkenau, which was the largest extermination camp in Poland. Uh, my father, after a few months, was taken on two death marches. One he survived, the other one he almost didn't. On the second death march, when he almost reached the Camp Terezin in Czechoslovakia, he was left in the snow for dead. Uh, after the war, I found out that my father is in the hospital in Terezin, but they couldn't save him, he died. Uh, he died a few months later. My brother, on the other hand, escaped uh, from the Hungarian forced labor camp and uh, became a partisan in Slovakia. I just want to tell you that in Slovakia, my brother says that amongst the partisans, he could not tell anybody that he was a Jew because even, even the partisans who were fighting the same cause he was fighting, um, was dangerous because the, the anti-Semitism was, was so bad. I just want to say one thing. Anybody today that denies that the Holocaust happened must be an evil-spirited, ignorant anti-Semite because the Holocaust is probably the most recorded event in the history of mankind. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Renee. We now come back to New York City, to the New York Tolerance Center, where uh, we'd like to ask uh, Inga Arbach to please uh, step to the podium at the New York Tolerance Center. Thank you very much. My name is Inga Auerbacher. I was born on December 31st, 1934, in a little village called Kippenheim in Germany very close to France and Switzerland. Kippenheim had a population of about 2,000 people, 60 Jewish families. Please proceed. Yeah, well, I can't. Yeah. Um, We have to be tolerant Shall I repeat? Yeah. yeah, I think it should yes, be. Yes, Inga, please proceed. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I repeat from the beginning. 
Yes. No, no, no. My name is you know, Inga. You don't have to start from the beginning. We heard you. Just proceed from where you were. Okay. Um, we were uh, about 60 Jewish families living there, and uh, my father was a disabled war veteran from World War I, had the Iron Cross. We considered ourselves very proud Germans, but with the Jewish religion. I came from a, a very religious home. I was the only child my parents had. In fact, when I was born, the, there was only one doctor in the village, no hospital, and the doctor was not Jewish. He came to my mother's bedside with a Nazi uniform. He already belonged to the Nazi party, but he still took care of his Jewish patients. I never really felt myself any different until November 10th, 1938, uh, Kristallnacht. Kristallnacht was the first riot against the Jewish people in Germany and in Austria. By us, it happened on November 10th. My grandparents had come to visit us, my maternal grandparents from another little village about 300 miles away. My grandfather went to the uh, synagogue in the morning to say his morning prayers and was arrested and sent to Dachau. The police came to our house and arrested my father uh, and also sent him to Dachau. All men from the age of 16 were arrested. Only women and children were left behind in the village. Our house was totally demolished. Uh, all the glass was broken. In our, We had a very large house, about 16 rooms, and we had to hide in a backyard shed because the bricks were just about hitting us, uh, and we had to protect our lives, so only women and children were left. It was a wake-up call, even though my father, who was highly decorated, was treated very badly in Dachau, and they let these men go after a few weeks, and he came home, and we decided to sell the house at cheap price, moved in with my grandparents. My grandfather died soon afterwards, and in 1941, the transports to the east began. It just uh, a little bit uh, uh, before I started school, uh, it, there was only one Jewish school in the province of Württemberg in Stuttgart. One minute. I would become the only child who was in a camp who survived from the whole state of Württemberg. I was born in Baden. And the, um, it was also the time before the transport, just a little before, when we had to wear the yellow star. I was only six years old, and here is my star that I wore. There are still threads around it. And um, I never finished my first grade. Uh, after six months, it stopped. Tra transports began. The first one went to Riga, and uh, we uh, my grandmother was sent to Riga. We were later shipped to Terezin um, in Czechoslovakia. We were 15,000 children, about 1% or so made it. We were young seconds. children. We were liberated. Okay. Me we okay. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. We now go to the Canadian friends of the It's South. so important to Thank learn you. from each other. Thank you. God bless you. We now go back to Toronto to Canadian friends and we call upon Judy Cohen in Toronto to please step forward to the uh, podium and uh, Judy my name is Judy Wiesenberg Cohen I come from Debrecen as was the, mo uh, the youngest of seven siblings in a modern Orthodox family enjoying a happy life till I was 15 and a half years old. More than six decades laden with tears, pain, and sorrowful memories have passed since those fateful two days when Adolf Eichmann uh, marched into Hungary with a small contingent of the German army on March 19 and March, March 19 and March 20, 1944. Theirs was the task to liquidate the last largest Jewish community in Central Europe. With the total cooperation of the Hungarian government, police, the dreaded gendarmes, 
they rounded up and executed or achieved the deportation of close to half a million Hungarian Jews, and it took only 57 days. They were really in a great hurry with the Hungarian Jews. June 29, 1944 is etched in my memory forever. The freight train will start to move with a screech and a jolt bolted tightly by the SS and Hungarian soldiers. And the trade carried us to an unknown destination. It was full to the brim with 78 people, including most members of my immediate family and others, my parents, my 18-month-old nephew Peter, my sister-in-law, my three sisters, and myself, and many young cousins of my female cousins with their young children. The condition in the cattle car was dreadful and it definitely overshadowed, uh, uh, um, foreshadowed something ominous to come. On July 3rd, the train stopped and we arrived to the largest, most efficient industrial death factory of all times. On arrival, right away, the males and females were separated and the last time I saw my mother and we never even had a chance to say goodbye. The selection continued with the women only from that point on. And within minutes, we noticed that young women like myself and my sisters and others, we went to the right, young mothers with their children, the elderly, all the pregnant women were sent to the left. It took a few days before we learned that all those who were sent to the left, including my members of my immediate family, were murdered in the gas chambers of Auschwitz-Birkenau and their bodies were burned in the crematoria. It was Nazi policy to murder Jewish children 14 years and younger. With that, it was state-sanctioned legalized murder because everybody in the Holocaust was murdered legally. During the spring and summer of 1944, when I was in Auschwitz-Birkenau, the gas chamber was going day and night. And we always lived with the stench, the specific odor of burning human flesh. How many left? I spent three and a half months in Auschwitz-Birkenau, then three months in Bergen-Belsen, a typhus-infested concentration camp, and then in a slave labor camp. Finally, I was liberated on a death march by the U.S. Army, and out of the 500 who started out originally, only 200 survived. I am here to testify and ask the world that 6 million, and this is 6 million Jews were murdered by the Nazis. Please, I'm asking the world, don't let them to be murdered twice by erasing their family, their memories by the president of Iran. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. God bless you. Uh, we're back now in Los Angeles. We call on uh, Mr. Tom Fleischman to please step forward and to share his story with us all. Tom. My name is Tom Fleischman. I was born in Hungary in a small town about 60 miles southeast of Budapest. Uh, in 1944, May, um, we were rounded up and taken to another town very nearby called Seged into a, uh, what was then a brick fabricating factory. And that was the collection point from which uh, three transports took off. Now the town that I lived in at the time, in, from 38 on when I was born, had the second largest Jewish population in Hungary. And of the 800 people that lived there at the time, about 330 survived. The rest perished. And the ones that survived, um, from the transports that started out from Seged, uh, two of the transports went to Auschwitz. The third, I'm told, didn't make it, and that was the one we were on, 
because something happened to the tracks, either bombed by partisans or allies, but the tracks to Auschwitz uh, were inoperative. So we ended up in a German city called Gmünd, actually Austria, where uh, we worked in a potato factory. From there, we were taken to Terezin, and that's where we were liberated. Um, I find this whole thing kind of incredible, but not particularly surprising that people like Ahmadinejad and Richard Irving and others uh, can stand today, given what's available as proof that six million Jews and five million non-Jews were decimated in six years. Um, and you wonder how the world can listen to this. It's, it's, it's quite remarkable. Uh, my story isn't as compelling as others, really. Um, my family survived, incredibly, four of us. But um, we saw and heard incredible stories. And I've been back to the town that I was born in. And interestingly enough, the Gentiles of the town spent over a million dollars refurbishing the synagogue with a Holocaust memorial. And that memorial itself uh, speaks more clearly and more compellingly to what happened than anything you could see because they collected the pictures of all the kids that didn't make it back. Um, it's, it's just a remarkable little museum that they put together in this small town. So um, it happened, we saw it, we lived it, and if people like Ahmadinejad have way away, it will continue happening, like it's happening now in other parts of the world. Thank you, Tom. God bless you. We now uh, return to New York, to the New York Tolerance Center, where uh, we ask Carl Shapiro, to please step up, step up to the podium and make his presentation. Carl? My name is Carl Shapiro. I was born in 1934 in Breslau, Germany. Uh, like now, I'm a retired engineer. My wife is a teacher, and we have three children. We live in New York City. Uh, around 1939, the Germans threw us out of Breslau, Germany. We found ourselves and the German occupation Poland, we became refugees, and we moved in the direction eastward where we found ourselves on the Russian occupation. We went that direction because we had our, I had my grandparents there, my aunts and uncles, nephews, nieces, and cousins. My childhood was basically a normal childhood of a five, six year old but all this stopped around 1940, 1941. I was the only child. My father was a, had an elegant haberdashery store. My mother was a housewife. And we were, when we arrived in a Polish town called Kalusz, in the southeast portion of Poland, uh, within a few months, the town was occupied by the Germans. We were placed in the ghetto. By the way, the town consisted of 15,000 people, of which roughly 5,500 were Jews, and the remainders were Poles and Ukrainians. Our ghetto had no barbed wires, no fences, and no dogs, because the local population was watching us. My, child, my experience is that of a hidden child and protected by my parents. My father's fluent German and knowledge of bookkeeping saved us because he helped the German officer administered some of the work that he was doing. Uh, for the, during 1941 and part of 1942, of the 5,500 Jews in town, several hundred just were remaining. The rest were taken off in groups of people and just vanished. At this point, my parents sent me to live with my aunt and uncle in a labor camp while they tried to escape. Eventually they escaped and were hidden by a Polish farmer 
who uh, was provided by money by another Polish family. Thus, out of the 9,000 Christians in town, two families helped to save Jews. I lived with 17 other Jews in a hole dug underground for a year and a half. We had no, I didn't see sunlight. We lived on barely a piece of bread and some water. There was a baby with us and baby cried and unfortunately she was suffocated so the rest of us can live. At this point comes March of, nine, uh, comes uh, uh, June of 1948. We were liberated by the Russian army. The Polish man tells us to come out of the, uh, comes up, tells us to come out of the hiding. We meet the Russian officer. We, we thank him. He yells at us and says, "Keep your mouth shut. Don't tell anyone you're Jews because some of the local people or some of the Russians will kill you." We went back to the town of Kausch. Again, I'm repeating, population of 15,000 and 5,500 Jews, only 20 survived. So my parents and I are the only intact family that survived. We stayed around for a few months. At this point, the Russians said anyone who is of Polish or German descent must leave. So we were thrown out of Eastern Poland together with several, other Pol several million other Poles. We moved into back to Breslau, Germany. Now it was called Wroclaw which Poland annexed to itself and threw again throughout 10 million Germans. We went to DP camp in Germany and from there we came to the United States. Uh, please remember what uh, the philosopher Edmund Burke said, for evil to triumph, good men have to do nothing. I kept my silence until 10 years ago and at Queens College where I worked, a Holocaust, the Holocaust and I came to talk whether the Holocaust took place. In 9-11, when we were attacked, I felt I was physically attacked again. And now when I went to my daughter's weddings, there were 450 people there. When I looked around, there was no one from my side. So if anyone questions whether the Holocaust took place, remember that all the documents were prepared by the Germans. If this monster, and I cannot use any other name, this monster in human form, manages to convince that the Holocaust never took place, the new generations will pay for it. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. God bless you. We now return to Toronto, and um, we ask Edith Sereni to please step up to the microphone. Go back to Toronto, Canada. Well, my name is Edith Sereni. <coughs> I was born Grossman, Poland, in 1980. My parents were religious Jews. We were seven children, four brothers. And I was exposed to anti-Semitism when I was five years old. The Hungarians were eight at the Jews even before the horror started. We started 1944, March the 19th, when the Germans occupied or run down Hungary. Soon after, March the 19th, we were supposed to wear the yellow star, and we were concentrated in the so-called Jewish houses. And they forced my two, four brothers to the forced labor camp, and one went to, two of them went, uh, they were uh, uh, to Ukraine, and they used them to explode field mines. And one brother in 1945 came home with one eye and crippled arm. As, as he stepped on the mine, the, his partner, because they did it with body system, he was exploded. And my brother lost an eye and an arm during this period. And in Budapest, we were concentrated at so-called Jewish homes. And later on, in, 19, for, in October 15th, the Hungarian militia took over, which is, was worse than the German occupation. And then the Swiss consulate offered us some shelter. We were four, uh, two, 2,000 people in one building, which was made for, uh, built for 200 people. So, and, and uh, they took us in. We didn't have much to, we have had nothing practically to eat. And our old maid, who used to help my mother, 
uh, snuck in a little potato in newspaper, and that's what we had for 10 days. We had, and in, nine, in Christmas night, there was a pogrom. We heard the, we heard the shots, and then came the, the militia and drove us out from the building, all of us, and uh, we had to walk down to the Danube, and they started to shoot. But the Hungarian police force came our, our, our rescue and they es this escorted back to the shelter. That was, it happened the Christmas night and New Year's night. Twice they drove us out to the Danube and they started to shoot and we had to put our hands on the head and we heard the shots. I didn't know my brother was in it, my sister, my future sister-in-law in the lineup, and I didn't know whether they are alive or not. Fortunately, we survived. And I thank the Hungarian policemen for being saved. And then in, 19, in 45 January the 18th, uh, the, the fact is they couldn't take us out from Budapest because there was already a siege. The Russian army surrounded the city. They wanted to export us to Poland to the Auschwitz, but they couldn't because of the siege. And then in 1945, January the 18th, we heard the first steps of the Soviet army. They saved our life. And my everlasting thanks for the Soviet Union, it's a Soviet army. They saved us, all of us. Thank you so much for listening to my story. I wish I could tell you more. I have more stories, but we have only five minutes. Thank you, Edith. Thank we you. We appreciate it. We now uh, come back to uh, Los Angeles. And just to remind everyone who's here in LA and those of you who are uh, in the other cities that we have a petition to the incoming UN Secretary General, Mr. Baum, to urge him to uh, continue to make the issue of Holocaust education and memory a top priority at the United Nations, which means, in a practical way, to also confront and condemn explicitly the Holocaust deniers in Iran and elsewhere around the world. You can either sign in today before you leave, uh, or you can go to our website at Wiesenthal.com to sign in. And I also want to just pause for a moment to thank everyone who has participated so far. No one has gone over the five-minute limit, and uh, we appreciate uh, uh, everyone's uh, brevity and uh, their commitment. And now in Los Angeles, I'd like to ask Eva Brown to please step up and to share with us for a few minutes her thoughts. Good morning. My name is Eva Brown. I'm honored and privileged to give my testimony, which is ours sacred duty the survivors to remember the six million innocent people who died. I speak at the Simon Wiesenthal Center every week and share my story with different audiences with great responses. I never thought being the witness to the truth that we will have a conference that we have to prove our suffering. I was born in Hungary in 1927, a large Orthodox family, seven children. I was the middle child. My father was a World War I hero, and that's why it was such a shame that he fought for Hungary's freedom, received five medals for distinguished service, and they killed 67 members of my family. My grandmother and grandfather, before they arrived to Auschwitz, suffocated in the cattle car. In 1944, March 19, the German army invaded Hungary. My oldest brother was taken to forced labor camp. He froze to death in Kursek, which is not too far, where the city where I was born. My mother, my seven-year-old brother, and 13-year-old sister were taken to Auschwitz. I was separated from them, and I was taken to different concentration camps, Auschwitz, Krakow, Plasov, 
Mildorf, Kaufering, Augsburg, and I was on the death march for two weeks, suffering from hunger and dehydration to the point that I had to drink my own urine just to keep myself alive. Not five minutes, but there's no way we can describe the torment, the genocide, the suffering, what we went through. Hungary was the last country that the German army invaded. So the concentration camp for the Hungarians lasted only a year. When I was liberated, May 1st, 1945, the 82nd Airborne, and all the people who were on the death march, if they would not come that day, none of us would survive. I was in Feldhofing for t three weeks. I started to feel better and I wanted to come home. I, the American army took me to Auschwitz, from Auschwitz and, uh, excuse me, from Feldhofing and uh, we went to Prague and from there I took the train there was no room inside, and my friend and I was traveling on the top of the train from Prague to Budapest, hoping and trying to find my family and friend. Seven of us survived from the 67, and since then, I'm the only one left who carries the torch for my family and the six million who did not have a voice. Since I'm in the United States, we had opportunities. I got married, I raised my children, and I was determined to tell my story, anyone who is ready to listen. And that's what I'm doing in the last six years, talking to audiences and uh, talking about our suffering so no one will have to go through what we went through that educators, students will learn from the past and it will not be repeated. This is really an opportunity for me to remember the people who have no voice and uh, I'm the witness to the truth. I've been there, I lived it, and everything the survivors remember, you know, and uh, it's true. I don't have a written speech or I never write notes. Everything is in my heart and my memory. So I hope the leaders of the free world will listen to our voices and try to understand the suffering that took place 60 some years ago that it should never be repeated again. Thank you so much for allowing me to talk to all of you and I hope it will help. <clears throat> very humbled by all of these presentations, and it's a very sad day that this kind of conference has to be convened, where the survivors must bring up their pain yet again. We now return to New York City, where we ask Mr. Hans Dudelheim to please share his unique story with us. Hans? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Uh, I am Hans Dudelheim. I was born in Berlin. Uh, both of my parents were dentists. My father died early on when I was three years old. So I don't remember much of my father. Uh, life, my early life was pleasant enough uh, until 1935. That was the first time uh, we experienced uh, that, that my brother and I were different. The Nuremberg laws were passed in 1935. Uh, I went to a public school, and in 1938, I was uh, suddenly dismissed. Uh, in the meantime, uh, pictures were taken. Uh, at school, and I had no idea what it was all about. I thought perhaps it was for a uh, school book, but a few months later, I was called to the police station, and I was 
issued a pass. German Reich with a J. Now the J does not stand for joyful or Jesus. It stood for Jew. And inside, you see it was fingerprinted and you had to adopt the name of Israel. Your middle name was Israel when you, as a boy and as a woman, you were Sarah. So it was Hans Rudolf Israel Dudelheim. It was supposed to be renewed in 1944, but German efficiency fell down, obviously because I was not called back. So I still have this as proof that I was considered a Jew, even so I am a Mischling. My father was Jewish, my mother is Christian. Uh, Mischling, they never did a pass with an M saying Mischling, I was a Jew. So it all is very complicated, a Jew first degree. Uh, in 1938, after leaving the German school, I was lucky enough to attend a Jewish school for about a year, and eventually that school was closed by the Gestapo, and thus ended my education as a young boy. Uh, during the war, I was imprisoned twice. I was imprisoned at a Sammellager. It was the last stop of Jews caught in Berlin on their way to the extermination camps. Uh, I had to wear the Star of David, which I did not do. Most of the time, I was, I think, a spunky kid, and I think I challenged whatever, I challenged the gods, perhaps. But I did not wear the Star only. If I had to go to the draft board, I got a card, and they wanted to draft me, and then I came on the Star, and the officer said, what the hell are you doing here? Uh, you know, get the hell out of here. Uh, so most of my friends at the Jewish school disappeared, and I'm sure that most of them were killed, and so did my family from, the, from my father's side. My grandmother, Fanny, she was living at an old age home, and one day we got a postcard that a f friendly German lady s sent and said, uh, and my grandmother said, I'm sorry, but I had to leave on a, on a trip. And, and the whole building, the whole old age home was uh, disappeared, and I never knew what happened to my grandmother. Uh, so uh, the denial of the Holocaust by so-called scholars, I think it's an insult to, to the many people that perished in these camps, and I, I, I don't think, I don't think we can allow that. Happen. Thank you. Uh, which was near a large city called Kosice. I came from an Orthodox family, and uh, my extended family, we lived together in a big house, my grandparents and my uncle and aunts. I had two younger brothers and a little sister. We, Czechoslovakian Jewry, had 20 golden years in this country, which was a democracy. And we were aware by 1938 that something serious was happening in Nazi Germany. And uh, there were certain things in the air. And by 1939, Nazi Germany had assembled all the skills and mechanics of a modern state. The entire industrial might of the country, railways, civil workers, poison gas, armies, navies, ministries of propaganda, a ministry of genealogy. They simply changed the laws for the Jews. But above all, there was a massive apparatus of deception. And the first victim was my country, Czechoslovakia. We were offered up on the altar of appeasement to a dictator who even wrote down a document that if he is given the Sudeten part of Czechoslovakia, he will not start a war. That document wasn't worth the paper it was written on. And we need to remember these signals that are given out by dictators. Did anybody hear these signals that Hitler was giving on so many occasions? There was nobody to confront him. 
my country was partitioned, and where I lived, we were given to Hungary, and I happened to be an ethnic Hungarian. This was the language we spoke in my house, and our life changed. We lived in a fascist country with all the things, the edicts that came out on a daily basis. By 1949, when the turn of the Hungarian Jewry came, this was at the end of the war, 44. seven weeks later perhaps, the Allies landed in Normandy. But they were so determined to ship us out, and I was shipped from a brickyard from Kasha, and it took us three days and nights to arrive in Birkenau, and that was a horror story by itself of what it's like to be closed in with 100 people in a boxcar. I arrived in Birkenau, Auschwitz, where we were selected, my, my family, my mother, my grandparents, my aunt, my two younger brothers, and my little sister. They were marched off this platform to be gassed on the spot. My father and uncle were chosen to be slave laborers for the Reich, and I was chosen to be a slave laborer. I was 15 years old. I was given a tattooed number and a striped uniform, and I was sent to Auschwitz I, where I spent nine months. I was very fortunate that my father and my uncle were with me. They were my guardian angels. Without them, I would not have survived the first week in this terrible place. Well, that didn't last too long because selections went on. And just recently, the last few years, about three years ago, I got some documents from the Auschwitz archives where I found out what happened to my father and my uncle. They were selected out on July the 10th, 1944, for medical experiments. And they say that the pen is mightier than the sword, and the documents are here for everybody to see. They are in the archives in Poland. This is a document sent to the SS High Command with names of people and their numbers. And this is where the number of my father, Eisen Zoltan, and Eisen Yenov, A9891 and 9892, are to be seen. There is nowhere else they don't have a marker. This is their last will and testament. In reality, this is a death warrant. Everything was documented. I got my number. I was booked in to Auschwitz, it says here. May the 8th, 1944, and booked into uh, Mauthausen, January 25, 1945. Needless to say, after July the 10th, 1944, I was on my own, and I was marched in two other camps by the Nazis. They practically killed us on the road, and I was liberated in a camp called Ebensee. I was liberated by an American Black tank unit, it was called the 761st Black Battalion. 30 seconds. And this is the battalion commander, Johnny Stevens. There's more proof. I came back to Slovakia in, 19, in 1945 to find that there were less than 20 people came back from my town of 400 Jews. So I just want to in closing, I want to say that the Shoah is and will always be a black hole in modern European history. They chose to commit mass murder, and they carried it out over a period of years. As we say in Czech, Pravda Vitezi, the truth will prevail. Oh, Mac. Thank you, Max. <laughs> We're now back in Los Angeles and ask uh, Ignaz Gross to please step uh -huh. forward. Um. This is the story of my <laughs> oh God. Okay. story of my parents, Ignaz Gross and Elizabeth Gross. Um, and my father was born 1914 in a small village, it's a Karad. It's um, uh, it, it was an Orthodox community, about 60 family. Mother is from the same same community. Uh, after uh, father had five siblings, mother had three. 
and all uncles, aunts, and cousins lived in that community. My father is the young was the youngest in their family, so was my mother. Um, after Passover, her Passover just finished, and uh, next day, grandmother changed dishes and was ready to to cook when um, SS soldiers came to the door and rounded them up and took them to the synagogue. Next day from the synagogue, they took them to Shatoraya Uihel. This is a, a smaller city near the Czechoslovakian border. And they were staying there for about three weeks, sleeping on the floor in Jewish homes, ghetto, until they arranged the transportation to go to Auschwitz. That time they did not know, I don't know if um, the Hungarians were just uh, so Hungarian or so um, not in touch with the international community, but they didn't think that they are going, th they were hoping, not, they were convinced they are going for a labor camp instead of arriving in Auschwitz. In the cattle car, 8,200 pe people, both my mother and father was in separate cars and one little um, dish for, for toilet. Some people died in the car they or my family survived the trip. Um, when they arrived to Auschwitz with the stick, an SS soldier came in and, and hit them to, to jump off the car faster, faster. They um, had to go right and left. Father and mother went to the right side. Uh, my, my grandmother was young, only in the early 40s, but was holding the hand of the nephew, and so he went, she had to go to the left. My uh, father's family, everybody went to the left, except uh, two of his nephews. They were 15 and 16 years old, who were staying with him in the line and the uh, sister shouted back to him that take care of them. But the boys were so attached to the mother that they, they ran to the mother and so all of them perished. Um, father from Auschwitz went to Kittritze. It's a, it's a camp, belonged to the Gross Rosen camp, about five kilometers where they were, um, cleaning up forests, and they were building um, storage facilities for, for um, oh God, guns and, and, and such. They were building railroads. Um, he was with people who generally knew because it was the same, same area. Mother was uh, after uh, from Auschwitz went to Birkenau, back to Auschwitz again, and then Langenbilau, working in a airplane factory. Both of them were li liberated by the by, by by the Russian army. Uh, father was from eighty kilogram went to forty, and when after liberating, he was he saw a mirror and looked at himself and didn't know it was him, couldn't recognize himself. From the family, nobody came back. Uh, they were two survivors. Thank you. Oh. Sorry. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We now return to New York City, <coughs> where uh, we ask uh, Clara Feldman to please step up to the podium and to once again share her experiences with uh, the conference. Clara? My name is Clara Wester Feldman, and I'm a survivor of the Holocaust. 
To be a survivor means to have a remainder life what, uh, what is hap after what has happened does not really make sense. I consider it an insult to be standing here today and to say what happened to the world while the Jewish people and many others were being incinerated. I've now been a volunteer for the Simon Wiesenthal Center for over 22 years. And what I really carry with me is a booklet which was ordered by then General Eisenhower in 1945 because General Eisenhower, who then became the President of the United States, said the day will come when people will say that the Holocaust never took place. And so again, after all these years, I'm standing here, as I've done many other times, and I say, you have to look at what General Eisenhower said. And he had requested 12 congressional leaders and 12 leaders, leading editor of the United States to come and say, see, what was considered at the time the most civilized country in the world, the country of the three Bs. I usually do not say the Nazis because the Nazis is the name of a party. The Germans knew what happened from the very, very beginning. I was born in a town in Poland, which was Austria when my parents were born. But my parents felt that Poland was so anti-Semitic even then that we had we moved to Germany. And when Hitler came to power in 1933, I was attending a public school. And after the election, I was chosen by then the civilized German teacher because he had to show the children of pure German blood how much pain a Jew pig can endure. And he asked me to stretch out my right arm, which I did. And then he started hitting me, and he hit me over again. I'm usually asked, how many times did he hit? Do you remember? And I don't. The only thing I do remember is the laughter of the other children. Within a week of the elections, we were ordered out of Germany because my parents were not German citizens. We applied to many countries. We lived in six different countries. And we finally landed in Italy. When that clown of Mussolini formed an alliance in 1938 with Nazi Germany. Then again, my principal called me and he said, collect your things and don't ever, ever come back. We don't allow Jews in our school. 1940, Italy joined Germany in World War II. My father was arrested. My family was dispersed. The time is very limited. Just let me tell you that my parents lost over 100 members of their family. There were 25,000 Jews in the town where I was born, and after the war, seven remained. This is a highly emotional time for me. I have seen children thrown in the air so the Germans would have target practice and again, I would repeat, it is with great pain and sorrow that I stand here. And I told you just a little bit about my past. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Clara. God bless you. And God bless you for all your efforts. We now go to Toronto, Canada, Canadian friends. We ask uh, Ellie Gutz to uh, please uh, step forward and present your testimony. Ellie? Hi, I'm Ellie Gotts. I'm a retired electrical engineer. 
and I was born in Lithuania in 1928. Uh, I was 13 years old when my life changed totally when Germany invaded the Soviet Union and threw us through it Lithuania in 1941. The Kaunas ghetto was established where 30,000 Jews were locked up in a very constrained and tight place. And uh, soon after, after having, having been robbed of uh, all valuables and furs and cameras and everything that we had individually as families, one day they gave an order that all of us have to appear in a big open field in the center of the ghetto. And uh, there was in charge a man, Helmut Raukath. He was a Hauptschauführer of the Gestapo, a captain of the Gestapo. And we all had to walk by in groups of families past him. And he made what was for us our first selection. Some were told to go to the right and some to the left. He separated whole families, he did whatever. But at the end of the day, he had separated 9,200 people, put them outside the ghetto fence under guard, and there they remained for the night. The rest of us, the rest of the people went back into our homes in the ghetto. The following morning, we saw a long stream of people marching up the hill towards the ninth fort, the ninth fortification, a military compound up the hill. And there, on the 30th of September, 1941, under the management of Helmut Rauka, 9,200 people were murdered with machine guns and thrown in trenches that had been prepared before. We know exactly how many were there. We know 2,007 men, 2,920 women, 4,273 children. How do we know that number? Because the Germans were very thorough. Because an assistant, Karl Jäger, Standartenführer of the SS, wrote it in his report, which we have, how many people were murdered on that day, almost a third of our population of the ghetto. This is just one event. Helmut Rauka survived. He was hiding in Canada. He lived here over 30 years till he came to a court case. And they sent him back to Germany uh, to be tried. <clears throat> Our evidence as survivors pales compared to the records that are kept in Germany of everything that happened during the Holocaust. There are just been open 27 kilometers of shelving containing the history of the Holocaust, every detail, just as someone here read their numbers. We are not the best evidence. German records are the best evidence for the Holocaust. Thank you. Thank you. As we return now to uh, Los Angeles, I want to um, also let you know we're beginning to get some details of the first uh, day of what transpired in Tehran. It will surprise no one that among the most vocal people there is David Duke, the profession probably America's foremost racist, bigot, uh, and anti-Semite. Uh, we also have word from our friends in uh, Germany that there are six uh, German, quote unquote, academics who attended. We do not know yet who they are or what role, if any, they're playing. But uh, those details are, uh, are coming uh, forward. And I also want everyone to know who's presenting here and who will be presenting in the coming hours that uh, your, your uh, commitment and courage and tears uh, are reaching out to millions of people across the globe uh, by way of the media. It is a very uh, troubling and humbling experience for the, those of us to be here with you, and we're very grateful that you took the time to once again stand up. And now we ask in Los Angeles, Dorothy Greenstein, Greenstein to please uh, come forward for a few minutes and share her story.
Good morning, everyone. My name is Dorothy Greenstein, née Dvora Kirschenbaum. I am the youngest of ten children. My father was a rabbi. He was a judge, a dayan, and a shochet. And we lived uh, in Otwotsk, near Warsaw, in Poland. I had a very good life until eight years old. Uh, we learned Hebrew. And I spoke Yiddish to my parents, and of course, I went to a Polish school because we had private teachers. Um, the Germans came in, I would call them really the Nazis, and they marched in in September. We were bombed before they marched in, and we were really scared. But my father was very optimistic. He thought the Germans are civilized people, and they would not do any harm was an optimist and he believed it. But when they came in, right away, the Polish people and the Jews had to surrender all the radios in a week. Afterwards, only the Jews had to surrender all furs in a week. Then my father said, well, what else can they do? He believed that nothing will happen. We surrendered also uh, leather goods and wool goods and my father still said, well, what else can they do? But they put us in the ghetto in 1940, and we had to abandon all our furniture. And we took only mattresses and very little things because we couldn't fit in to a bedroom and a kitchen. There was great hunger, and because I was the youngest, I was nine years old, I turned in the ghetto. I went out for two and a half years on the Polish side to buy food. Now, you have to remember that the Germans did not watch uh, the fences or the blocks, but the Polish people did. When they recognized a Jew, they would take him to the Germans. But I was lucky. My Polish was perfect. And that's how we lived in, uh, in the ghetto. They came in 1940, the Germans, and they caught my uh, two brothers to work camp in Karchev, which was not far from Otwotsk. And they worked in quarries of uh, stones to make roads for the German. They didn't like to be splashed with, uh, because it rains a lot in Poland. But when my father heard that they are going, the Germans are going to resettle us, he was a very wise man, and he says, resettle? We've been resettled once. They want to kill us. Till then, he didn't believe. Well, uh, we were four girls that weren't married, and he sent us out to save ourselves, to perpetuate the Jewish people. And maybe if we'll be lucky, we'll live to see Israel as a state. And we survived. I ran away from three ghettos. I was hidden three weeks only by different Polish people. And um, then I went on Polish papers uh, to Warsaw to work as a maid. I was liberated in 1945 in Krakow by the Russians. And unfortunately, I did lose my parents, my brother, and two sisters. And I say to all those deniers, I went on a march of the living last April to Poland. Those that are denying that the Holocaust ever happened, let them go to Poland and see the, the over six million graves. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dorothy.
We now return to the New York Tolerance Center, where we um, would like to hear right now from Saul Rosencrantz. Saul, please. Good afternoon. My, my name is Saul Rosencrantz. I happen to be a Holocaust survivor. Came to New York shortly after the war in July of 46. Uh, I am originally from Poland uh, and uh, from a city called Krosniewice, which is located on the crossroads between uh, Warsaw Berlin, which is east-west, and two more cities, one uh, north and south would be Gdańsk and Lodz, and we are on the very crossroads. It's, the name is Krosniewice, about 5,000 population, and 2,000 were Jewish people. Uh, within 10 days after the war started, the Nazis came in, and they started showing their face. What are they doing? The first thing they are doing is uh, riding through the streets and announcing that no Jew is allowed to walk on sidewalks. We had to, we had to walk in the gutter, just where cars and horse and buggies. Uh, they, made, they issue they ordered every Jewish person will have to put on a yellow Star of David in the front and the back. They issue they ordered every Jewish person will have to work two days every week, no pay. Uh, Go, they're issuing an order, any Jewish man wearing a beard must cut his beard immediately. And of course, if they caught anyone soon after, they did their own cutting their own way. And I'm not going to go into it. They took the rabbi, his name was Shlomo Engelman, an elderly man over 75 years old. He was our rabbi forever, not only him, his father and his grandfather were our rabbis in our city. They took the rabbi, his wife, and three sons and placed them in the front of the, of the, the synagogue and machine gunned the entire family. They made sure Jewish people were coming to watch. Now they're just about ready to create a ghetto riding throughout this uh, city with bullhorns and, and uh, announcing which street is going to be the ghetto. And it happened to be the street that we lived in and the corner building from that ghetto was ours and we lived in it because we were nine people in my immediate family. I had both my parents at that time, uh, and we were uh, uh, five siblings, that's seven, but my eldest brother was married, they had a wife and a little boy, a total of nine. And of course, if I was to tell you, after the war, out of the nine, only, se only two survived, myself and one of my brothers, the middle brother. So we are nine in my family. After the ghetto was established, we're having 20 people in our apartment. And the ghetto is established, fenced off all around. And now they're ready to come and invade the ghetto. They keep, they keep in, uh, invading every morning and grabbing people out. My father was the first victim uh, in a group of about 30, 35 people. And that, that was going on on a daily basis. One of, the, one of the jobs that the Jewish police had to fill was to send young people, young boys and girls, up to the Germans and do domestic work. I was assigned to uh, go up there and primarily to shine their shoes, which was quite disturbing. Uh, but the trick was when, as soon as we came into their bedrooms, the floors were very terrible and they were squeaking and they kept jumping off because all the boys before me were treated the same way. They were beaten up and of course, when they ran back to the ghetto and beyond that, they were sent to camps. I managed to hide out in our own building until 1941. By that time, not a single boy was left, so I, w I was next. And of course, the, the minute I came up the first time, I was treated the same way and could not come back the following morning. The guy came into the ghetto and looked me up and he threatened me that I must come back the following morning, which I did. I was bandaged and I went back. <clears throat> One minute. By this time, we are by this time, we are only six people left. Three of my family members are in camps. My father was gone, my two siblings. One day, a couple comes into the ghetto and I ran into them at the gate and they told me that they escaped from their city in the nick of time. Their ghetto was being liquidated. Because I took it very hard and I checked with the chief of police, the German, his name was Dank Samida. And he verified, he told me I should not be afraid until March 1st. Uh, I saw tra cars, trains going by up towards Trevlinka, day in and day out. 
the job that I had was close to the perimeter of the, of the factory, and Jewish people were loaded, transported up to Treblinka day and night. And of course, my family was among that, in the, in, in that part of the country, that part of Poland was called the, the uh, Protectorat. And they caught up with this part of the, of the country, a few cities where they involved, and they uh, started transporting these people. My family was there as well, because I, as these people were riding by in the train, people threw out notes from the cars by the hundreds, by the hundreds, and we uh, were able to get those notes. Of course, I had a note from my own family, mm -hmm. and they knew they were going to their death. Uh, after the war, of course, needless to say, I went through six concentration camps, two in Poland, two in Germany, and two more in Czechoslovakia, where I was liberated by the Russians in Theresienstadt. After the war, I came back home. I wanted to know what happened after I escaped. So the Polacks told me uh, the Nazis came in that Sunday on March 1st, and they issued the order everybody out from their home. An uncle of mine could not. He was sick in bed. They shot him in the bed. A cousin of mine managed to escape over the fence with a little boy, of course. Uh, they gunned hard down, and the little boy on the outside. They took the 800 people out from the ghetto and placed them that very Sunday in different, in different buildings nearby. On Monday, they came with sealed trucks, literally sealed trucks, and they fumed poison gas into the trucks, and they dumped the bodies in Chelno, which is not far from us. And this was the system that the Nazis did throughout Europe. Um, thank you, Saul. At this point, I want to thank uh, Fania, Heller, Inga Offenbacher, Carl Shapiro, Hans Dudelheim, Clara Feldman, and Saul Rosenkrantz, and also to thank our Eastern director, Rhonda Barrett, as well as Sidney Pringle for putting this together at the New York end, and also to recognize my colleague Mark Weitzman, who just an hour ago completed a press conference with the President's Conference of all the Jewish organizations, held a press conference in Manhattan in solidarity with this event and obviously to speak out against Ahmadinejad. We invite the people at the New York Tolerance Center to continue uh, to view the rest of the conference. We now go back to Canadian friends uh, up in Toronto, and we ask Magda Hilf to please step forward and share her story. Magda? Yes, my name is Magda Hilf. After traveling two terrifying days and nights in a cattle car, my family and I arrived to our destination. My family, my immediate family, consisted of my 85-year-old grandfather, my parents, my sister with her two children, my 18-year-old brother and myself, 22 years old. When the train stopped, the doors were opened. We heard orders in German, out, out, fast, fast. We got, us, we got out as fast as we could. On the, <clears throat> on the platform, we saw SS men, men in striped pyjama type, uh, pyjamas and hats and a lot of dogs. An elegant, good-looking SS officer started to separate us, us, us immediately we were on the platform. Young women and, uh, young women and men, men to one side, older women and men to the other side, mothers with children to the older people. When I was separated from my mother, I became panicky. You see, my mother was disabled person, she had, she had, she needed me, she could not manage without me. I ran back to her, I, I, I ran back to her and there was a man, a guard who protected her, who watched her in the striped pyjamas and I begged the car, guard, please let me stay with my mother, she's a helpless woman, she needs me, I want to stay with my mother. The guard got very angry at me, screamed at me, you go where you were sent. But I did not give up so easily. I ran back two more times to, to the guard, begging, I could speak a few words, uh, uh, German, begging the guard, please, please just let me stay with my mother. I have to stay with my mother. She's a helpless woman. Finally, he got very angry at me and threw me to the ground. And he said, 
You go where you were sent, your mother will be taken by a truck, you will see her later. I picked myself up, I was very scared. I had time to look at my mother, and she, let, she looked at, my, at me, and this was the last time that I saw her. This is my short story. I could t talk to you two more hours, but I want to leave other people also time. Thank you, Magda. We now uh, return to Los Angeles, and we ask Bronco Lustig to come up and spend a few minutes with us. My name is Branko Lustig. My number is A3317. And uh, I first thing about Holocaust was I remember when my mother and my father went one night. Los over, Angeles, your microphone is muted. Over the over the river river in Osiek, the river name was Drava, and we went to survive. We fled from the Ustashas, the Nazis, in Croatia, and we went to Hungary. We were thinking that they would be better. But then my father was, because he didn't have a permit for work, he was thrown out from Hungary. He went to the partisans in Croatia and, uh, I mean, former Yugoslavia. And my mother and me, we were taken to a concentration camp in Hungary, pick up place, and from there we went to Auschwitz-Birkenau. I know that I'm very happy that so many survivors still around, and then we can tell to the deniers what we survived and how we survived, and. Um, Pity, but in 10, 20, 30 years, there will be not any more people like we to tell the truth. And um, I went through already a conference like this many years ago in Germany, and I was talking with some people, some Nazis, and um, also denied and told them in their face what actually happened, and they didn't believe it. So anyway, I was in Auschwitz. I was separated by my mother, from my mother, and I went in a small camp, Fürstengrube, where I was working in a coal mine. I was uh, 11, 12 years old, and from there I was on a, on a, um, when I was weak, I cannot work anymore, I was taken to Birkenau. I escaped from the track. I saw people getting in the crematoria. I was then in Auschwitz. From Auschwitz, I survived the death march to, to, to Germany in an open box car. In snow, we went to Dora, other concentration camp. I stayed in Dora two, three months. And then from Dora, I was on the end, taken to Bergen-Belsen, where I get typhoid. And, um, I already died, but then the Scottish traps, the British came and liberated us, and then that was the end. And then I find my mother after two and a half years in Bergen Belsen, and uh, that was the only happy end after the war because when we came back to Yugoslavia, uh, we didn't find anybody from our family. They were all killed, or in Auschwitz, or in Croatia in a camp called Jasenovac, or in Osijek. And that's my short story. Thank you. Thank you, Branko. We now go back to uh, Toronto, Canadian friends, and now we would ask uh, Fagy Liebman if she would please uh, share her story with us. Feige? My name is Feige, maiden name Schmidt Libman. I was born in Kaunas, Lithuania, just like Ellie Gotts, a very cosmopolitan city. My mother was born in a small town, and she persuaded her father to let her come to the big city to become a nurse. My father 
was an intellectual. He spoke five foreign languages in those days, and he had an international bookstore. I was born on July 29th, 1934. I had a very good life. My paternal grandparents lived across the street from us. We had a beautiful home. I had beautiful clothes, and I used to go and visit my grandparents in Krakinova. My mother used to take me in the summer to show me off. June 1941, our lives turned upside down. Germany invaded Lithuania. And with helpers, we never heard from our relatives in the small towns. We were told that they were liquidated immediately. I, was, I went to the ghetto with my parents and my paternal grandparents. And my mother, as a nurse, went into, uh, into the hospital to work. And you've heard life in ghetto was terrible. I, was, I remember always being hungry. And Ellie Gott told you already about the selection. But I have to tell you about this first selection. Helmut Rauka lived a couple of streets away where I still live in Toronto, Canada. Can you imagine? And I never spoke about what happened to me. When I heard that he was arrested, I started to speak. And I'm going to tell you now a very vivid memory what happened to me. 1944, the ghetto is being liquidated. We were told that no matter what, we have to leave. We were loaded on cattle cars, very crowded, not enough food, not enough water. My father, my mother, and, my, and me. My grandparents were taken away with this action that Ellie told you before. And that was the last time after we were told, we traveled for three or four days in the cattle cars, and when we came to an opening, the men and the women were separated. And that was the last time I saw my father. My father, my strong, intellectual, healthy young man, was taken to Dachau. My mother had me to fight for. We were taken to Stutthof, and I was 10 years old, a little kid. I don't know what persuaded my mother when we were told to go into showers. We were lucky the ovens weren't working. She took me to a pile of clothes, ladies' clothes, and stuffed me in the right places. And when we registered, because people were coming from all over, I saw a lot of Hungarian women there with their heads shaved and with, in uniforms. We were not, there wasn't enough time. It was July 1944. And she, when we registered, she told them that I am 12 years old. Arbeitsfähig. Maybe I can be a worker and not a child to be exterminated right away. And I was lucky. They accepted me. And we went into the concentration camp, and my mother again went into the infirmary. And lo and behold, she noticed that I have blotches on my neck. Can you imagine when she discovered that I have scarlet fever? And there were some nice nurses in the infirmary because they wrapped my neck around with a scarf and they, the German doctors that went on rounds never saw me. I was taken from bed to bed and I survived. In the filth, sleeping in bunks, one on top of each other, locked up at night and the sanitation was a pale. Can you imagine? And my mother heard that they needed women slave labor to big trenches. And I was picked with my mother, and we left the concentration camp. I was in three labor camps. In the dead of winter, we slept on straw in tents, and I was a fantastic trench digger. I used to make a portion, a double portion of soup. We were liberated in 1945, at the end of January, and I found out that was the time that my father was killed. He gave up hope. My mother had me to fight for. And I am going to fight. 
the president of Iran. I go from school to school, Catholic schools, anybody who asks me, I talk what happened. Because the young people are our future. They have to know what happened. And to the day I die, I'm going to fight him by being a speaker, by telling what happened. My mother and I were the only survivors. The, Jew, the Lithuanian Jews lost 90% per capita more than anybody else. So thank you very much for giving me a chance to talk. And let's hope that we won't have to meet again about other deniers. Yimach Shemo. Am Yisrael Chai. Amen. Thank you, Feige. We now return to Los Angeles and ask Laser Rossman to please come forward. My name is Esther Lehner. I'm going to speak on behalf of my dad, uh, Mr. Laser Rossman. Um, my dad was born in 1912 in Transylvania, which at the moment is in Romania. Um, in 1941, uh, when um, the Hungarian army uh, took over Transylvania, uh, with the help of the Germans. Um, he was conscripted in the Hungarian army. The, maybe there were one or two Jews in the whole army. They took him because uh, they owned trucks and they wanted the trucks. He ended up on the Russian front where in the Ukraines he witnessed um, the killing of Jews in trenches, uh, similar to the one mentioned uh, in Lithuania. Um, he survived the army to come back to um, the little town called Ritag, um, where his mom and uh, sister-in-law and my nephews lived. Uh, they were the only one left because uh, the men were taken to uh, forced labor. Um, he thought to protect his mom, so he stayed there. When the, um, the Hungarians and Germans um, decided to put them in a ghetto in a forest uh, near Dej, um, he went with uh, his mom and uh, sister-in-law and the children to try to protect them because he, he thought, uh, he knew what was coming, but he wasn't, he, they were told that uh, they're going to a work camp, so he could not believe that it will be just as bad as it was in the Ukraines. Um, they, um, in May 1944, that's when they, they took, it, took them away on a transport to Auschwitz in cattle cars. Um, there were 70 to 75 people in each uh, cattle car. They arrived in Auschwitz, and um, that's when he realized the mistake he made for allowing uh, his mom and, and the family to go. Um, of course, they had no choice. The, um, that's the last he saw of his mom, his sister-in-law, and the three small children. Um, they were all taken to the, uh, to the gas chambers and the crematorium. Uh, he was taken to different camps. Uh, he, ended, uh, he was in Bochum Verein, uh, Buchenwald, and um, he survived uh, because he was a strapping young man, healthy. Otherwise, uh, he wouldn't have um, all his friends and uh, the, all his relatives and my extended family of about 40 perished in the camps, never came back. Um, he survived on sometimes on garbage that was uh, brought from the kitchen, from the SS kitchen. He had a friend who brought him the garbage, leftover food that he ate. Um, and uh, he survived a few times because the um, when they called all the Jews out to to the appell, and it was meant they killed them all at, uh, towards the end of the war, he did not go. He decided to hide in the latrine. Um, so he survived till the um, American army liberated him in Buchenwald. Um, the fact that we have to come and uh, with, uh, be witnesses to these atrocities, uh, that we have to prove that they happened. It's an abomination. It's uh, something we have to fight for and, uh, and not allow it, never again. 
Thank you, Laser. Thank you very much for being with us. We now return to Toronto, Canada, and we ask Vera Schiff to please share her recollections with us. Vera? Good afternoon. My name is Vera Schiff, and I do come from Czechoslovakia. I uh, have been born in Prague, a capital city of that country that has been dismembered and overrun by the Nazis in 1939. The western part of it, Bohemian Moravia, became the protectorate of Bohemian Moravia incorporated into the German Reich. Therefore, the discrimination in the Nazi law became immediately valid to Prague Jews or Czech Jews, and therefore also the uh, the whole brutality and the whole uh, uh, six years of our suffering exacted an enormous cost to 90% of the Czech Jews who never returned. My family lived in Prague in a very comfortable middle class setting and we knew little of anti-Semitism and persecution because the uh, uh, Czechoslovak Republic fostered democracy, equality and human rights. That changed overnight on the 15th of March 39 when the Nazis Occupy the country. And as they didn't miss a beat, they have immediately implemented the laws of, which they already had in power in Germany and marginalized us and removed us gradually from the midst of the society with which we have lived comfortably for 20 years. And uh, this time, of course, uh, the situation is worsened. We were expelled from all walks of activities as uh, normal citizens were. And soon we were order to wear the Star of David, the six-pointed yellow patch, and I brought you one of mine, which I, for some reason, still have with me. And uh, before long, it become obvious that not only we won't be able to work or coexist or live in Prague, but we will be removed into some resettlement areas, which was really a euphemism to deportation to the east, which spelled, of course, death. Uh, the Czechoslovak or the protectorate Jews were first deported, some of them, to Poland, but before long there was a transit camp established in Theresienstadt, and that was a camp which supposedly was to serve as transit to uh, the final solution of Jewish question, which of course was that. But, uh, and people were supposed to stay there maybe days, weeks, outside months. I spent there three years, and that in itself is a bizarre miracle. But uh, uh, suffice to say at this station that when we were deported there with the 50 kilograms of basic uh, which we were allowed to take with us, we were uh, singled out to stay only due to the uh, generosity of a friend of my father, a Gentile, who uh, took it upon himself to help Jews, our family and others, for which he eventually paid with his life. And I always like to mention Mr. Josef Blecha, the righteous among nations, who sacrificed his young life to honor his friends and the loyalty to them. The life in Theresienstadt was uh, full of misery. It was a crowded uh, one-time garrison town in which the Germans packed thousands and thousands of Jews and initially planned it only for, as a temporary stay. This time, Theresienstadt had many other functions. It became a camp for the elderly. Uh, it became a camp for the uh, well-known VIPs, Jewish, uh, of Europe. It became eventually a station to which the Germans brought in a Red Cross. Uh, everyone's um, uh, commitment uh, to be here with us today, and obviously after the next presentation, the Los Angeles presentations will go much more quickly as it becomes the main focus uh, of the conference. Edith. You can even sit down if you like. <clears throat> Many things were, were said already that I, I was planning to say. Uh, my name is Edith Singer. I was born in Czechoslovakia, Hus, Karpatovus. I am the youngest of three, I was the youngest of three children. My father was in the lumber business and he was a hostage. I have here a picture from my family. And he was one of those people that one day he walked in when the Hungarians came in, that his beard was shaven. And this is one of the things I used to mention when I speak in the museum. Uh, I heard somebody here from Czechoslovakia saying the Czechs are not anti-Semites. I have to, to counter this because in my hometown, 
under the checks, I felt that I'm a Jewish child when I was five years old or three years old. I was in kindergarten, the Jewish children were sitting in the back of the room, and they were always checked for lies. They never checked the non-Jewish children, and this is, this is my earliest memory of anti-Semitism. Um, all my life, I wanted to go to school, and when the Hungarians came in, I was not allowed to go. Yeah, I was junior high school, and I could finish junior high school, but all the children who were younger, a year or more than I was, could not attend junior high school or high school because they were Jewish. I wanted to go to high school. I couldn't because I was Jewish. But after the war, the first thing, wherever I was, I went to school, and, and finally I graduated high school in Yiddish because there were no uh, other schools where I was. But it, there were people who were all kind of experts in chemistry and mathematics, and they volunteered. They were not really teachers, but they, they, they were our teachers. Then I came to America. I went back to school, and I became a teacher. I am one of those people who have a number. And when I started to teach, an eight-year-old child walked up to me, and he, said, he saw it because in September I had a short sleeve dress, and he said, Mrs. Singer, what is this, this number on your arm? Is this your phone number? Usually when I tell the story, people laugh. I wasn't laughing. I became so angry, so hurt, because I expected everybody to know what this number is. And I came home and I told my family, and then I started to think, what do I expect from an eight-year-old child if nobody told him? Because when I was liberated, I told myself, I will never talk about it, I will never think about it, I'm going out to build a new life. And here I started my new life. At that time I was already married and I had two daughters. And here comes a child and asks me, this is my phone number. And then I started to think, this is, the child is not, it's not his fault, nobody told him. And this is how I started 40 years ago to talk about my experiences. Uh, <laughs> it's okay. This is how we treat our friends and that's what we do to our enemies. I wanted to say something to them, but anyway, uh, I lost my father who was 43 years old. I lost my brother who was 18 years old. My mother, by some, some miracle, she wasn't a healthy woman, she survived. My sister lives in Israel and we started to do the new life. I have two daughters and four grandchildren, and one of my granddaughters was in Auschwitz this last summer. She wrote a beautiful letter, and we have a very special feeling to each other. She went into Auschwitz the same age as I was, 16 years old, but she wrote me a letter that she went in as if I told her this, and she told me she's going there. I said, you are going there the same age I was, but you are going as a free Jew. And she wrote a letter about freedom means to her, and that she will cherish it and fight for freedom all over the world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Edith. God bless you. We now come back to Toronto. I would like to, um, at this point, before we uh, ask uh, Sally Wasserman to start, I just want to thank the team up in Toronto, Abhi Ben Lolo, Leo Adler, David Eisenstein, and especially uh, Michael Edeke, who put together uh, a fantastic uh, and powerful team of survivors who've done, um, who've informed all of us and moved us all. And I want to thank in advance Sally Wasserman and thank also Esther Bem, Judy Cohen, Edith Sereni, Max Eisen, Ellie Gotts, Magda Hilf, Peggy Liebman, and Vera Schiff. And for our last presenter uh, this afternoon in Toronto, uh, I'm honored to ask Sally Wasserman to speak with us. Thank you. During the Second World War, one and a half million Jewish children were murdered by the Nazis. I want to give this testimony in their honor because they cannot speak for themselves today. My name is Sally Wasserman, and I am one of only 10% of Jewish children 
who survived the Holocaust. I was born in Katowice, Poland on January 23rd, 1935. In September of 1939, all Jews were expelled from Katowice. I, together with my parents and my younger brother, left and went to live in a smaller city in Poland named Dombrowa. In the winter of 1941, at the age of six, my world took a real turn for the worst. Because up till then, I really wasn't aware of the war. And that was the time when my mother told me that my father was taken away and I won't see him until the war ends. I did not understand what that meant. All I knew is that I no longer had daddy and I never saw him again. In the winter of 1942, my world turned upside down. I was seven years old and my mother and my younger brother and I were forced to go into a ghetto that was established in Dombrova. That probably was the closest that I will ever get to um, a hole in hell. Uh, we endured 14 months in this ghetto. It was overcrowded, disease was prevalent, hunger was unbelievably difficult to cope with, especially for the children as I. And life was really very difficult. We were not schooled, we were just left to fend for ourselves. Okay. The ghetto was liquidated in July of 1943. I survived because my mother gave me away at the age of eight to a Christian Polish couple very righteous, very brave, very decent human beings who took me in. They did not do this for any monetary gain. They did this because they did not want to be bystanders. They were truly humane people. They hid me for two and a half years where no one knew that I lived with them. They shared their food with me because they only received rations for two people. They were kind to me. They were protective of me. I began to trust them and ultimately I began to love them. Now the war did end, we were liberated in 1945 by the Russian army. A year later, I left Poland and I left my rescuers. They were my only family at that time. And I arrived in Toronto, February of 1947 as a 12 year old war orphan. Now the Holocaust was the darkest chapter in our history. It was really the worst, the most terrible consequence of hate, of religious and racial intolerance the world has ever known. It robbed me of my childhood, my family, my parents, 
and left me an orphan at the age of eight. It is easy to deny the event that happened over 60 years ago. But the Holocaust did happen. It happened in this civilized 20th century. And again, I would like to say that anyone who denies that this ever happened, I would like them personally to explain to me what happened <coughs> to my six-year-old brother who was murdered in Auschwitz, to my 33-year-old mother, and to my 36-year-old father who was also murdered in Auschwitz, and to the one and a half million children who did not survive the Holocaust. Thank you. Thank you, Sally. And thank, thank our friends up in Toronto, Canada, for their historic contribution to uh, today's conference. I now uh, turn over uh, the uh, conference proceedings to Lieber Gaff, the director of the Museum of Tolerance, and to uh, remind every survivor who's here, if you came today, we're going to hear from you. We're going to make sure that your story is a part of uh, today's uh, conference, and more than that, a permanent part of our archives and made available through the Museum of Tolerance to educators and students for a long time to come, longer than the deniers will be around. Thank you. Eva? We're honored to continue this testimony to the truth. It's often asked, what is the answer to hate speech? Censorship is not one that we offer in a country that values the freedom of speech. But more free speech is the answer. And we need to speak more loudly with the voices of truth than those haters who would deny this unconscionable act in human history. We're honored to hear from all of you here today. And we ask that Mr. Alan Greenstein please continue with his testimony at this time. My name is Ellen Greenstein. I was born in Poland in the city of Patov near Kelt in 12-25-1925. In 1940, when the ghetto was created in Opatov, we were forced to start working in uh, stone quarries in building a highway from Opatov to Sandomierz. In 1942, when the ghetto was liquidated, I was selected with two of my brothers and we remained in the city as an Aufrands commando. In November 1942, the ghetto was liquidated and we were sent to Sandomierz to the second ghetto. That ghetto was also liquidated in January 1943. From there, I was selected with my brothers, and they were sent to a labor camp in Skarżysko. We worked in Skarżysko in an ammunition factory so long till the Russians started advancing. When the Russians were advancing in Poland, we were sent to Częstochowa. And we worked in the same company, Hasak, as an, in ammunition factories. When they the Russian army was approached in Częstochow. It was in January the, the 10, 1945, that we were transported to Buchenwald. I was in Buchenwald since January the 16, 1945, till April the 11, 1945, when I was liberated. I escaped three times from the selection in Buchenwald to send us to Toten March. The American Army liberated us in 1945 in Buchenwald. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Greenstein, and God bless you. We're joined today by Mr. Gerhard Naschkowski, and I ask him please to share his uh, message with us briefly. 
I'm Gerhard Maschkowski. I made it my point to come here today. I'm moving out of Los Angeles today, so it's a special privilege for me to be here. I'm a German Jew. I have experienced Hitler for 12 years. My first experience were in school, when right after his election, uh, I was put in the rear row of the class and I was ignored and I wasn't, I was mistreated by my former friends. All of a sudden, they didn't speak to me anymore. Uh, well, you heard of the 1935 uh, laws that the Jews were given and then 38, the Crystal Night, the synagogue burned, we witnessed it. Uh, my father, by the way, was blinded in the First World War, fighting for the Germans. Uh, they, pardon, they deported him also to Theresienstadt. I was, uh, since I was thrown out of school, I literally kicked out. I lived in a small town near Gdansk, uh, and, but that was still Germany, East Germany, and I uh, had to leave town because I couldn't go outside. I was, would have been beaten, so I was supposed to go to a Ju uh, Jewish school near Hanover uh, to learn a trade but it turned out to be a labor camp. And I was put into two more labor camps, and in 43 I was deported to Auschwitz with the whole camp that I was in. We went through the selection, and uh, I was fortunate since we were workers, since we were workers in, uh, in the labor camps, uh, we were sent to Buna Monovitz, which was I.G. Farben, who used us as slave laborers. Uh, you can imagine how we, how we lived in the barracks, 200 in, in each barrack, two, three in a bunk. Uh, well, you probably had the experience. And the f worst thing that happened was a death march after the 17th of January, 1945. I was on the death march for four months. Every day we marched. We were reduced from 3,000 people to 200. If anybody, I would, I am, I would like to know, or I would like to talk to one of the naysayers that I would, uh, I have been looking for them in Europe in this country, I would like to say, talk to one of the deniers to convince them that it happened. I have the proof. I have a number on my arm. I have proof from the Germans that I was there. I had to sign a paper that I wasn't a criminal and that I was not involved in, in uh, politics. And I was uh, 15, 16 years old. Thank you for listening. I still like to see one denier to approach me so I convince him that it is not true what he is saying. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moskowski. We wish you luck with your move and continued health and strength wherever you are going. Um, I'm honored to call on Jack Vorsanger to please share his um, story with us at this time. <laughs> My name is Jack Vorzanger, and I was born in the Netherlands, and I grew up in Belgium. And there is one word that will always will stay with me. The word is jump. It was one of the last things my mother said to me when she told me to jump off the truck that was taking us to Auschwitz. <coughs> My father already had been taken. The Nazis came to our home one night and took him. 
And when they came for my mother and me, they loaded us in the trucks in alphabetical order. Being that my last name was Voorzanger, I was put in the last truck. And before the truck left, my mother made a desperate plea for me to jump. I was 12 years old and I was scared. My mother was my world. And she wanted me to jump into another world. One without my parents, my family, and the safety and comfort of home. Terrified, I jumped. I managed to follow the trucks undetected by the Nazis. My mother, along with countless others, were taken to a train depot. I searched the crowd, and unbelievably, I found her. I ran to her, and again, she pleaded with me to run. She told me to find a Mr. de Kock, a man with whom my parents had previously made arrangements to take care of me, should anything ever happen to them. Crying, I did what I was told, and I ran away. It was the last time I ever saw my mother. That was how I came to live in hiding with the Cock family. With seven of their own children, the last thing they wanted was me. I was forced to work as a servant in the house and was treated cruelly, physically, and sexually abused. Demoralized and completely alone, they took the last remaining link I had to my family, my Jewish identity. I was made to go to a seminary, was baptized. He told me that doing so would bring my parents back to me. I did it, wanting to hold on to any bit of hope. As years passed, my hope faded and my parents were not coming back. My family was gone. And then one day, the Nazis came for me. I was out in the yard picking cherries from the tree when I heard a commotion coming from the house next door. The Nazis had learned of my being hidden and came to take me, but they had the wrong address. The house next door was completely ransacked while I stayed hidden in the cherry tree outside. I was saved from the concentration camp for a second time. When my mother was on the train heading to Auschwitz, she wrote me a postcard and threw it out of the window. On the postcard she wrote, whoever finds it, please mail it. Someone did find it and mailed it, and in her note to me she wrote, not to worry, this will all be over soon. I cherish this note. and carried it in my pocket every day. One day, the Dukak children took the postcard and ripped it in a million tiny pieces right in front of me. They destroyed my last gift from my mother. If not for their cruelty, I would still have that note with me today. For anyone to deny the Holocaust is to deny my pain. They deny my suffering. They deny the death of my parents. If my parents were not killed, then bring them back to me. If the Holocaust never happened, then while I saw growing up in the warmth of my home surrounded by the love of my parents, don't tell me the Holocaust never happened. Don't tell me my parents were never taken from me and I would never be with them again. 
After 70 years of abuse and neglect, I had enough, and I was old enough to get to set out on my own. I went to Holland and joined the Dutch Air Force. I got married and had a son. Sadly, my wife passed away in childbirth, and I was left to raise our son, Freddy, on my own. I wanted the best life possible for him and was ready to start a new life for myself, and Belgium left me too many sad memories. So Freddy and I came to the United States, and today I am married with three daughters, seven beautiful grandchildren, and I tell them all stories from my childhood, both the good and the bad. So my story will never be forgotten. So my parents will never be forgotten. Thank you. Shirley Sweetbaum, could I please invite you to share your story with us at this time? I was born in Bratislava, Czechoslovakia. In 1944, in September of 1994, two, uh, actually some SS, SS officers came to our home, chased us out, and we were sent to Auschwitz. Two of my sisters and myself was when the selection started, two of my sisters and myself were sent to one side. My parents were sent to the other side. We knew at the time that my parents were doomed to die. After 12 days, and the conditions on these cattle cars were just awful, as all of us that are here know. We had no food, we had no water, there were no sanitary facilities, and it was degrading. We arrived in Auschwitz, they dragged us, or pushed us off the cattle cars. My parents, as I said, went to the other side. We were in Auschwitz, my sisters and myself, we were in Auschwitz for 12 days, and then again, we were loaded on the cattle cars, and we went to Freiburg, which was a working camp. It was a factory. We worked 10-hour days in freezing conditions, with very little clothing. Each night, we were locked in on the top floor of a factory. We couldn't get out. We heard the planes droning overhead and bombs exploding. And each night, we thought this was going to be our last night. Several days later, part of the work that my sister and I did was loading and unloading heavy, uh, heavy crates. One, <clears throat> one of the crates fell on my leg, and I broke my leg. I continued working for five days with a broken leg. Then the supervisor, who was an elderly German civilian, told me, that he was going to take me to a hospital. Well, he did, and I went to a military hospital where the physician asked me, how long has it been since my leg was damaged? And I told him, five days. He looked at my supervisor because he did not believe this, and my supervisor nodded his head, and he, and the, and the physician turned around and said, this is inhuman. Now remember that this was a military hospital where there were many, many soldiers very badly hurt, and that was his opinion. Uh, in April, we were sent to Mauthausen. The conditions in Mauthausen were terrible, with which all of us, I'm sure, know. We were liberated in May of 1945. Two of my brothers also survived various camps, and unfortunately, one of my brothers was the witness of my parents being taken to the gas chambers. He lived with this tragedy and this sadness 
till the day they died. Many more of my family were lost during the Holocaust. Good morning. It is a sad day indeed that we have to defend of what took place. And um, I lived in Germany during the war. I was born in Berlin. My name is Vernon Wuschin. And I was wondering at that time what the outside world was going to do for us. And nobody did anything. Our media remained silent. And on this day, I asked the media, they go, knowing what's going on these days, that we still have people who are going to deny the Holocaust, that they finally speak up and tell the truth and tell the whole world what really took back and give them the evidence and publicize it. Only then can we accomplish that we finally will shut up those who deny the Holocaust. It is about time that we do it. Now, like I mentioned, I was born in Berlin and it was a life of hell. I lived with my parents and my sister and brother-in-law in a very, very bad circumstances because at that time they were pulling us out of our homes and putting it in the worst slum area as anybody can imagine. Most of the time we went hungry during the war years and came the weekend. My sister made a concussion of a concoction of potato peels and coffee grounds, so we had something to eat. Uh, eventually I lost over one hundred and twenty of my family members. And I asked those who still deny the Holocaust, find me where they vanished. Where are they? I asked to ask the media, and I asked also the Holocaust denier, we have one and a half million children, we have their names. Find those names and tell us what happened. And that is our goal, this is what we have to do. And uh, I lost, like I mentioned, I lost over 120 of my family members. We were picked up on February the 26th and transported to Auschwitz. Our arrival was put into Great cars pushed together, pushed together with bayonets and with rifles. There was no room, nothing to eat for the next two days and two nights. Finally, we got into Auschwitz and we had the selection. And our children were torn from their parents, husbands were separated from their wives. It was a terrible, terrible situation. But I don't have too much time to explain everything of what happened to us in Auschwitz. Uh, I first came to Gunnar Monowitz. I was severely injured and uh, I was selected to go to the gas chamber and I talked myself out of it, not going to the gas chamber. So I was very lucky that this happened to me. So I had witnessed so much while I was in Auschwitz. I have seen tens and tens of thousands of people dying in Auschwitz, being selected to go to the gas chambers in Auschwitz. And I also have seen the flames of the crematorias constantly belching their smoke and flames in the sky. And I promised myself at that particular time, somehow, whenever is a possibility, I shall take revenge, whatever I can do, even if it cost me my own life. So eventually, I was uh, thrown into a place called Verkhalo Krupp where they manufactured armaments, and we had to unload the machinery, and we had a capo, and most of you know who a capo was, he was the beast of Auschwitz, he was horrible. Okay, and uh, so, uh, what uh, we did, in other words, what I tried to do, remember what he did, so what I did in the factory, I sabotaged the, man, the uh, armament, production and actually our unit uh, actually uh, um, sabotaged 52 percent. We saved a tremendous amount of Allied soldiers. I was terribly beaten by this couple. I almost lost my life and I was caught the second time and I was condemned with 25 lashes with a letter with not letter wish. There was a death sentence. I escaped that just as well. So uh, we came now to the end of the war, and uh, on the night of uh, New Year's night, 1940, 
fought in 1945, we took revenge. I took revenge. We beat this Auschwitz, uh, this, this uh, Kapo, severely because we thought that he had given the name of the girls who took the uh, gunpowder from the factory to blow up the crematorium, and one of the girls was a well-known person, Rosa Roberta, and uh, I said, you know, the Nazis might kill us, but we are not killers. Throw him out and let him freeze to death. And he survived, and we were going to be executed within the next few days, and I accepted that just as well. Okay. Uh, I was sent on a death march, uh, and only 75 out of 6,000 uh, actually survived this death march. I was liberated in the city of Seesaub, and again, uh, the Germans had to unload the train where most of our prisoners had perished. So it's not a, it's a horrible story to tell. Some of it is the, for the first time I spoke about it because I really did not have the courage to remember of what took place. But for those who deny the Holocaust, there's one le lesson. We have to respect humanity and we have to remember that it shall never happen again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Vernon. Your courage and the courage of all of you here today make us the beneficiaries of being able to remember and never to forget. Rolf Gompritz, we are honored to ask you to please come up at this time. <coughs> My name is Rolf Gompertz. I was born December 29, 1927, in Krefeld, Germany. My parents and I experienced Kristallnacht, November 9, 1938. I was invited back to my hometown in 1988 to deliver the keynote speech on the 50th anniversary of that unholy night. In 2003, the BBC dramatized our story together with two other family stories of two other families, in the opening program titled Kristallnacht of a series titled Days That Shook the World, which was also seen in the United States on the History Channel. November 9th, 1938. Bismarck Strasse 118. It's two o'clock in the morning the next day. All is calm, all is quiet on this unholy night. I live on this, uh, we live on the second floor, I have a room on the third floor. Another month and I'll be 11 years old. Suddenly there's a pounding, a loud pounding on the front door. I run to the banister. I see my parents down below, frightened, hesitant. A pounding, a constant pounding. Open up, open up or we'll break the door down. My father wants to go down, my mother won't let him. He'd just been to the doctor that day and had an operation around the eyes. I'm scared. I go to my room, get a little suitcase, run out again, and call down to my father, Daddy, Daddy, Fati, Fati, if they take you, I'm going with you. My mother's down the stairs, opens the door. She and the door are hurled against the wall. Nazis, half a dozen of them with rifles, come rushing in and up the stairs. We all meet on the second floor. They try to lock us up in the kitchen. And my mother screams, we will not be locked up. And so we run around after each other, throughout the rooms. When my father gets to his desk, he opens a drawer, pulls out the iron cross as medal from World War I confronts the head Nazi and declares, is this the thanks I get for having served the fatherland? For a moment, silence, deadly silence. It seems like an eternity. And then suddenly the Nazi turns, signals his men, leads them out of the house, down the stairs, out of the house, into the black night. Elsewhere, dishes and windows, furniture and crystal break. The synagogue burns. Kristallnacht. Here and in this, all the cities of Germany. 
day breaks, but it, it isn't over. They come for my father to take him to the concentration camp. He's at the doctor's. They never come back for him and let him go. Kristallnacht was the dress rehearsal for the Holocaust. It launched the Holocaust. We lost family in the Holocaust. My grandmother was murdered. Two aunts and uncle and three cousins were murdered. One uncle and aunt were sent to Theresienstadt. And my uncle's wife, my aunt, and uh, this uncle were sent both to Theresienstadt and after Theresienstadt to Auschwitz. And they survived. One uncle was saved by his Christian wife who would not divorce him and kept him hidden in the attic of her sister's house. We fled to America. Now President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad and his followers tried to deny the Holocaust and want to unleash another genocide against us. Have they no shame? We must speak out, speak up, and act for the sake of common decency, our common humanity, and our souls. Thank you very, very much, Rolf. Elizabeth Mann. Would you please come up to the microphone at this time? Hi. My name is Elizabeth Mann. I am a survivor from Auschwitz, Birkenau, Bergen-Belsen, and a couple of other camps. <sighs> That's very hard for me suddenly to talk about what happened to me. In, I was born in Hungary. And uh, my father was in the First World War as a hero. He finished the war with medals. He was very, very secure that nothing ever can happen to us. We were Hungarians, but that proved differently. 1944, when Hitler overran the whole Europe, in Hungary, again second time came in with his men and tanks and then he announced to the Hungarian people that no, he occupied the country. And from that moment on, hell broke out against the Jews. My sister, who was a buyer for a Christian company in my city, Three days later, as the occupancy started, was sent by her boss to Budapest for a business errand. That was March 22nd, 1945, uh, 44. As he, as she arrived to the station, two SS men and some good willing Hungarians helped to take off the Jews from the train, between them my sister, and she disappeared. She never ever returned home. My parents never knew what happened to her. 1941, my brother, my older brother, was drafted to the Hungarian army as a Hungarian soldier and was sent to the Russian front to fight for Hungary and for Germany because we were allies, as Hitler announced it the first day as the war 1939 started. So, no, my older brother wa was at the front line. My sister disappeared. My mother became very, very ill and every single day something new law came into effect in Hungary. We had to wear the yellow star. We had curfew from one o'clock till three o'clock in my city. And if you think that yellow piece of cloth on your heart did not meant anything, you are wrong because 
When I did go to the grocery store with my ration coupon, worrying about the one and three o'clock time to get through the, in the line, then when I came to the shopkeeper's door, seeing me with the yellow star, he told me that I should step aside, no more milk, no more bread. And when I did, the woman who stood behind me received everything what I was denied. Every single day, two assessments came from door to door to homes where Jews lived. They took the Jews to the headquarters, beat them half death to make them confess where are the fortune of the Jews. That was not important what you said, you were still beaten. When they came to my door, my house, I answered the door and when two SS men asked for my father, I told them that they already took him away. They repeated the question again and the order, we came for your father and I repeated again, they already took him away. When finally they left and I shut the door behind myself as I stepped into the house door and when two SS men asked for my father, I told them that they already took him away. They repeated the question again and the order, we came for your father and I repeated again, they already took him away. When finally they left and I shut the door behind myself as I stepped into the house, I collapsed. Behind another door, about two yards away, I was hiding my father. Every single day we were put out for different oh, experiences. Then came the law, every Jew has to go to the uh, ghetto. When we did go to the ghetto, from ghetto we had to go to board the train. They said we will be together with the family, we will have plenty of time. And we were put 100 people into each ghetto car. Then we didn't know where we are going, we didn't know how long we will go, 100 people in one single dark cattle car, small babies, old people, young people, everybody was crying, screaming, terrified, and we were just going. Many people died and the dead people and the living were still in the same cattle car. Finally, the cattle car, oh God, <laughs> the cattle car stopped and we arrived to a place where they opened the door that was pitch dark as I looked out. Anywhere, everywhere, I saw SS men, German shepherd, be a darkness, tremendous noise, screaming and crying. Everybody tried to be together. My father and I t took off my mother and my little brother and we were standing very, very close to each other, holding each other in that tumult and then a loudspeaker came on and told us that everybody separate men form one group and women should form a second group with the children together. Then my little Pardon me? Yeah, that's what I try to do. Um, then well <laughs> One second, no, I lost myself. When we came to the point to separate, my little brother asked where do I belong, to the men or to the women? 
And uh, I told him to go with my mother, because mothers are the people who take care of sick children. You see, my brother had a problem, because in the Jewish religion, when a boy reached the age 13, became bar mitzvah. And that means that from that moment on, she, he is responsible for everything what he do or say. And my brother just five months earlier became bar mitzvah. And no, he did not know where does he belong, to the man or to the woman. So with my advice to go with my mother, I killed my brother because all the mothers and all the children right away was taken to the gas chamber. My whole family was killed. I am the only survivor. Thank you very much. Thank you. We certainly appreciate how painful and difficult it is to share these stories. And we're also very mindful that there is so much more that we need to hear and learn and understand. But we thank you for your courage in, sh in sharing just some of the important reflections that help to keep your voices amplified more loudly than those of the deniers and the haters. Harry Silvers, we are honored to call on you at this time to please share some short reflections and thoughts of your own experience. Before anything, I'd like to say one thing which impresses me enormously. I was always wondering the extent of miracles, and I never could understand how vast and big and how meaningful it can be until I listened to all the statements from your survivors. I'm one of the survivors too, but it doesn't compare to the sufferings and horrors that your people have gone through. And to have people denying the truth it won't work. There is no explanation and you cannot fight the truth, no matter how hard you try. But we, have to, we are the last remnant of the truth. And you do the right thing, and I'm trying to do the right thing, to bring the truth to the people, to the world, and to the deniers that they cannot live with it. They will die with it. My name is Harry Selvers. I'm from Brussels, Belgium. And I was 17 when the Germans invaded Belgium. In 1941, they came up with the first orders of persecution against the Jewish people in Belgium. The first one was they created the Jewish uh, Rat or count Jewish Council, which represented all the Jewish people in the nation. We had to wear the yellow stars. And for me personally, it was a horrible sensation to be expelled from the school like all the Jewish students in Belgium had to be expelled from all their classes. I felt like an outcast. I felt like a vacuum in my life. And I decided we cannot go on like that. We have to do something about it. I contacted my friends from the school, the Jewish friends, and said we organized ourselves as a youth group and we called ourselves the Young Jewish Students Group. We found a place in the forest where we uh, assembled several times a week only to find comfort and solace and support for each other just to be together. In 1942, suddenly the, the German troops arrested all, all traffic and transportation in Belgium, and they removed all the Jewish people who were traveling and whoever Jews they could find on the street. And between those people, where the most, most of my family were part of those people who were apprehended. They were all taken to Malin, which we found out later was a holding camp for transportation and deportation to the east. And when the, uh, when the Germans started expanding the, the persecution of the Jews, we decided to dissolve the youth group 
and I gave them all the address of our house. There was a panic, and my parents went into hiding. My youngest, my youngest brother was taken to my youngest brother was taken uh, to a monastery and was hiding there. I made our house a safe house with food and clothing, and I joined with Father Bruno Reinders, who was the commander of the Belgian resistance, to assist. We were able, the, a lot of the kids found the shelter in our house, and I was able, to a friend from the Judenrat, to uh, provide them with the jobs, and at the same time, I was able to contact Father Bruno to provide hiding places for other kids that found shelter in our house. My job was to help Father Bruno to provide food. To provide food, clothing, the truth will prevail. Thank you. Thank you very much, Harry. Here, here.